غبار غلاف ضريبة جفاف شعار السنين العجاف غبار يغطي المدى يغطي النهار يغطي المصاطب ولون الجدار يغطي عيون الكبار والصغار رمادي أحادي جديد في بلادي يمدد شطور الخرافة يدفن عنق النعام وغوام الزرافة قبار واسع الانتشار فيه شبهة هزيمة وهم انتصار قبار بن هائل يخلع مشاتل يأجج حروب القبائل قبار من بعيد يمحو الكلام الجديد الكلام اللي بقص الأثر لخريف من سحب أو ينابيع وزهور في الربيع This is Khartoum the capital city of the Sudan, their city, my capital city. This is how they want you to be, to behave, to dress, forced assimilation. You almost shout as the devil takes complete hold of you. Look at them, you continue jeering. Even so, you have no hatred in your heart for them. You have no hatred in your heart for anybody. All of a sudden you wish you were born in and belong to a different country, a totally different world. Perhaps things would have been different, much, much different. It is possible that in South Africa, in those dark days of apartheid, there were blacks or colors who wish they were white. You have often reflected. But you do not wish you were them, the northerners. You only wish you belong elsewhere. You see hundreds of them, the northerners, flowing this way and that like a cluster of ants that have discovered scattered crystals of sugar here, there, and everywhere. Most are in the common white jalabia, the ankle length garment. Look at them, you whisper to yourself scornfully, shaking your head once again. But deep down in you, Deep down in you, you know that it cannot be possible that they are all the same, that they are all to blame for everything. The coming together of uh, Sudanese writers for the first time, it is really a healing process for us. I, I wrote a lot about uh, being a Sudanese in, um, in the UK and, um, and um, the sort of the differences and the tension between the West and the East. But, uh, but this encounter, coming here to this encounter, has made me realize that these issues I was writing about are actually present even here within the Sudan. And uh, this is, this is uh, I, I mean, I, I sort of knew this, but now I, it, it's, it's been affirmed for me. And it's, it's, it's exciting because this is a, it's a challenging and a very fertile creatively. The story he read that night, uh, the day before yesterday, uh, was so uh, painful for me. Uh, it unmasked many things. And for me, I think the peace process here in Sudan uh, is not complete unless it is connected with, uh, you know, translating this type of stories and poetry so that, you know, the, 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 the North, the people of the North would see with their eyes, you know, in, uh, in an art form how human beings would suffer from many things and uh, and it's more explained in this uh, artistic way than in, uh, in politics, uh, political discourse. David, I'm trying to get to something. There's something you're not telling me. Mm. I, I want to know about the, that story. That there's, you know, I want to know about what is it that makes you so angry? Yeah. Are you, and are you still angry? Um, 
when I was writing that story, what what makes me angry is I was writing that story because I was in a foreign country and I wanted I was feeling like I wasn't at home. Then I was trying to then I was thinking about my country. Then I said, well, even in my country, I wasn't feeling at home. Do Northerners know of this pain, do you think? Maybe they, they know, maybe they don't know. But uh, I think they were not exposed to this kind of information. Maybe we, if we write more and more, and maybe we have translations, they will be exposed. That is, if there is freedom of expression in the Sudan. Talk to me about the relationship between the North and the South. I mean, this is a, uh, a critical moment for that relationship. Where do you think we're heading? I think we are definitely heading into cessation because the relationship is a complex one, but I know people are not unaware of what has been happening during the more than four decades of war in the South, civil war in the South. And like I mentioned earlier, I mean, in the story, even before Sudan got independence, there was already a civil war in the South, you know, so that tension between North and the South has been there for too long. It has been there for too long. If the Northerners want the Southerners to be with them, they have to accept them, you know. But if they don't accept them, then definitely we are heading to cessation. What, what does accepting mean to you? Accepting means Southerners should not be marginalized. You know? Politicians have talked about it. And by marginalization, what comes to my mind is somebody making decision, decisions for somebody else. You see? In the Sudan, if we take the politics, the history of the Sudan, it has been the politicians from the north who have been making decisions for the whole country. It's not only the south, by the way, which is marginalized. There are other areas like the east. The Nuba Mountains, even Darfur. At the moment, there's war in Darfur because of the same thing. It wasn't unusual um, for me to be sent to um, to a, a school which was run by nuns, and, uh, and even though it was a, it was a Catholic uh, mission school, most of the girls uh, in the school were Muslim girls. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. Yes, it is. It's very much. Nice I met my husband Nadir at um, in Kamboni when the two schools, the girls' school and the boys' schools, had a joint activity. And uh, at that time, I was um, in first senior, and he was in second senior. So that must have been maybe in '77, even or '78. Yeah, must have been quite early on. Are you still giving the girls an opportunity to mix with boys? <laughs> yeah, we have uh, some uh, joint activities. As we said before, the famous Komboni Day. You know? So we still have a sports day, cultural day. And, um, Here we had the beautiful building. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is one of the places you were particularly keen to revisit yes. at the school. What does it mean to you? Well, it's just, it's just, for me, it's just a symbol of beauty. You know, that, 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 that there was a lot of, for me, that this, I thought the sisters were beautiful in what they were wearing, and they were very inspiring for me. And um, I felt that they were very strong, that they have made a sacrifice, and, and they were dedicated, they had chosen a life, and, and they have given up you know, having a husband and children. And I knew even then that I could not do something like that, that I just would not have been, would not have the strength in me. 
So I admired them for that. I, I, I was aware of this and I admired them a lot for that. You, know? you are not the first one to tell me this. Okay. Because they came back and they said, when I saw the sister coming down, he gave me something great yeah. to start the new day with a good, yeah. good feeling. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I know, I knew that you were dedicating and giving, giving us all what you could. Yeah. What's wrong with us Africans? I asked Anwar, and he knew. He knew facts and history, but nothing he said gave me comfort or hope. The more he talked, the more confused I felt, groping for something simple. But he said nothing was simple, everything was complicated, everything was connected to history and economics. In Queensway, in High Street Kensington, we would watch the English, the Gulf Arabs, the Spanish, Japanese, Malaysians, Americans, and wonder how it would feel to have, like them, a stable country, a place where we could make future plans, and it wouldn't matter who the government was, they wouldn't mess up our day-to-day -day life. A country that was a familiar, reassuring background, a static landscape on which to paint dreams, a country we could leave at any time, return to at any time, and it would be there for, for us, solid, waiting, I said to him, thank God my parents didn't divorce. At least I had a stable family, a fractured country, but not a broken home. He said, silly girl, and laughed as if I had made him forget his worries. We are coming back next year. I like writing about Khartoum and the Khartoum I grew up in. And uh, it's, it's, it's because my memories are very vivid of it. And, um, and also because um, I want to, to, to tell other people about it. And it's, it's, it's uh, not many, I mean, the world doesn't know much about Khartoum. It's not, uh, it's not a city that, that, that a lot of people know about, and it's not, it doesn't particularly have a good uh, image, perhaps. So, um, so that makes me even more keen to describe it and to describe um, the kind of beauty I felt I, I experienced when I was living there. What are your fears for this city? I think people need to accept changes and to accept uh, diversity and to accept, uh, um, you know, the, the, how the the the, um, the the factors that that demography puts imposes on all of us. And uh, I think that some people might not. I'm not, I'm not aware of that enough, or there haven't been, there, there isn't a consciousness of this. The, the city has become more African to, to some extent, and while at the same time a lot of the Sudanese have gone to the Gulf and they've come back with, uh, with uh, influenced by the, the, the Gulf lifestyle and the, the Gulf culture, and they want to bring that in with them in, into Khartoum. And um, I'm not sure how these two are going to, to merge together, the, the, the African side and the, and the, the, the sort of the, the, the Gulf in influence side. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to go ahead. I would, like the, I would like Sudan to be part of the world. I would like you know, uh, to, uh, Khartoum to be part of the international community. I don't want it to be isolated. I don't feel that as Sudanese we deserve to be isolated.